So I've had these for a while, since last Halloween, well, shortly after last Halloween when I got them. I think I paid like 70 cents for this whole bag. And I like gummy candle. Candle. I like gummy candies and Ninja Turtles. And they look like little pizzas. Sort of. They're not the best likeness. Uh, and I kind of forgot I had them, and I had one, and I was like, oh, yes! And it tastes kind of like, um, banana-ish, kind of, but not like a banana runt or some other candy that's good. It's more like, uh, circus peanut banana gross bleh. Anyway, that was my point. Oh, hi, it's me, Gazbot, and this is the Horror Production Report update number 18. That's one, eight, sure, that's an eight. Hmm, I'm looking pretty scruffy. I better shave. <gasps> oh, well, I say, dear boy, I'm feeling much better about this whole affair. Now that I've shaven and washed, changed my shirt, I haven't really done my hair, but that's not important because we're not here to talk about my looks. I just felt like doing that. Um... So, this has been a very productive week. Um, not quite as productive as two weeks ago, but better than last week. I mostly got all my client work done. I had a few things left to finish up. I'm not going to go crazy chronological like I've done in the past, uh, but I am going to consult my notes. So, I only had a few uh, client work things left to do this week. Uh, one of which was sort of taking an avatar, uh, like a little teeny one, and uh, cleaning it up so that it could be large again. I think I mentioned that last week. But anyway, I finished all the weird exporting and stuff I had to do for that. Uh, I also had a coloring job uh, for Genuine Comics for an Earthling pinup, uh, which, uh, it was kind of weird. It was like sort of a scraggly... I don't know what the guy drew it in. It almost looked like a big pen or something, but it was a challenge to clean it up in color. Uh, I'll go ahead and show you what I was given and what I ended up with, and uh, you can see for yourself. And this is the character of the Earthling, which I previously colored on issue one, they're working on issue two right now, which I'm not working on, but this is a pinup that they had me do. I don't, I don't know what that is. Um, and that was, uh, oh, also I had to finish up some coloring on uh, the Kid Switch pages, which I did. I, I, I'm losing track of what I did uh, last week and this week. It's uh, this is a week update, so it's a shorter update, which is good. Uh, I mean, shorter time period, it'll probably still be, well, it'll be short, because last time was like an hour. I'm rambling. Uh, one thing I wanted to show you, though, was I had done kind of like a little Instagram of this. Um, I'm just going to put up a little slideshow of just a quick progression of how I work from rough to, to colors uh, by isolating a single figure. But anyway, I'm going to put up a little slideshow of that. Uh, this is a Kid Switch character I was working on for a panel, um, and I'll narrate over it. Right in this Kid Switch area, go! So this was sort of the rough I did up for my small thumbnail. Then I isolated this character, and this was sort of my pencils. Um, then I inked from that, but it was a little bit off model, and I didn't like the perspective on the way the shirt was hanging for where the horizon line was supposed to be. So I adjusted that, and then I went into flatting, and I flatted it all the flesh color he's going to be. Uh, and then I went ahead and colored him in his flat colors, which I have a palette for those colors. And as you can see, when I went in for shading, I brought in the palettes for shading as well. And I put my shades in really heavy, and then I lighten the layer to 50 or 25%. And then the last thing I do is put on a little bit of blush and some white for the glasses. Put it! Kid Switch! That was Kid Switch. Okay, but mostly I was working on the horror this week. Uh, I, I would say I averaged six hours a day. Some days I did more, some days I did less. But that was about my average. A big chunk of what I was doing was getting that preview book ready for the next show I do. So it's the first five pages of the comic, a mock-up cover, and then some text, you know, stuff. Which I didn't do the text stuff, but I got the first five pages done. They were already inked, but I got the grayscale done, I got the lettering done, uh, and I am pretty close to having the logo done for the mock-up front cover. Um, I've been getting help along the way from member various members of the 100s, uh, from the digital comic book uh, artists, wait, digital comic book artist group, yeah, <laughs> on Facebook, uh, and several others. Uh, a lot of people have given me opinions, pitched in. Uh, Kevin Phillips, I hope I'm remembering his name correctly, more than anyone else. He's super helpful. Uh, I don't know him at all, but he's always helping everybody out, myself included. And uh, it's funny because i had been so stressed about the art and drawing well and getting it done quickly and whatever. And while I still struggle with it and I still have my days when I'm not enjoying myself and everything, I have kind of fallen into a routine. I've gotten into that pattern of forcing myself to sit and draw for X amount of hours. And I was so into that that I'm like, I had done rough lettering before I really started even working on the art. I think I'd done the first page. But I did rough lettering just so I could send it out to a few people so they could kind of read the story. 
And I was I always knew I'd have to go back and redo it or hire someone, but I kind of forgot all about that. And I was like, oh, I got to do these five pages. I can't do these five pages with that lettering. Even if the lettering I did now doesn't prove to be the final lettering, at least it's readable and better. And I, I struggled with finding a font. I talked about this last time. Uh, I struggled with finding a font. And then I, once I had the font, there was the spacing issue. Uh, and then bubbles became a difficulty because I've been used to just sort of doing an ellipse and then putting a, uh, you know, what do you call it? A tail, I guess. Um, and that wasn't flying for myself or for anybody I showed it to. And so I had to go in and use path tools and the pen tool and all this like illustratory mathy stuff, which I really hate. Um, and actually I decided like kind of my second attempt when I learned a little bit, but was still figuring stuff out to make a video of it, which I did. And it was, it was two videos. They were about 20 something minutes each of me real time, figuring everything out and complaining and talking about what I was doing and what seemed to work and what didn't and what was giving me trouble and what was easy. So the people, it was less of a tutorial and more of a, hey, it's tough for me too. And here's like, you know, other people could point out, oh, well, the reason you're having trouble is this. And, you know, maybe use that as a jumping off point for better ways to show people how to do this or just to make, have people commiserate with the fact that uh, I also had trouble with lettering and the bubbles specifically. I thought the font stuff was difficult, but I kind of figured it out relatively quick. I mean, uh, not in terms of getting the perfect font, but in terms of being able to adjust the kerning and the spacing and all that stuff. But the bubbles proved to be a different animal altogether where I'm still struggling with them. The video I took though did not record sound. So I have like altogether like 45 minutes, 50 minutes of just silently me figuring out bubbles. Um, maybe I'll speed it up and put, okay, here's what I'll do. I'll speed it up and put a clip of it here and just talk over it a bit. It's not super interesting, so I'm not gonna show the whole thing, but just a couple minutes and you can see the kind of thing I was dealing with and struggling with uh, for way longer than I should have. But anyway, here is a lettering Jim Jam. So you can see the first thing I was doing was changing the font to the new font I chose and then I went into the character panel which is on the right there it looks like a little letter A and you could adjust all the different spacings the the kerning which is the space between the words the space between the letters um, the space you know the vertical space uh, and then I was trying to do the bubbles uh, and you can see I made it a small Oh, I was readjusting here. Uh, and the bubbles, I used uh, a shape tool or uh, and then adjusted it with the pen tool and the, the point selection, whatever. You see, I start with the basic ellipse. Then you get these little handles, and it's supposed to be super easy to adjust them. But I have such a hard time. Now, keep in mind, this is sped up like 10 times faster, and you can see how long it's taken me to do one. It's terrible. Uh, and... Um, once you get it all stroked like that, or once you get it all built like that, you can then move it around, and then there's this layer section instead, uh, I'm sorry, a path section instead of a layer section in Photoshop, and I imagine Illustrator and everything else too. Uh, so once again, I'm messing with it, uh, and then I have to go in and build a tail, and for that you use the pen tool, and this I found even harder than creating the initial bubble because I'm trying to get the right bend and you know depending on if you hold select or alternate or uh, you know control it bends different ways and it has or doesn't have a point and there's a lot of messing around and figuring it out and theoretically if I do it enough I'll, I'll kind of internalize some of it but some of it was I wasn't even sure what I was supposed to be doing and then there's two different ways well there's many different ways but one way here I filled it all in with black and then reduced the, the selection by a few pixels and then filled it in with white. You could also just stroke it uh, and then fill it in. But it's all about making a path and then turning that path into a selection is kind of what I get. All the different ways of making bubbles seem to be based around that general formula. Uh, now here I was changing the font uh, for them and, and I actually pushed it closer together accidentally, but then I thought that looked good because this guy's yelling so it gave it a little bit more personality. I also broke it up so it's more of the traditional uh, rounded shape and I uh, brought in a stock bubble that has some points on it. Uh, there are a few stock bubbles in Photoshop. Most of them are not very good. This one I took in and then adjusted and you can see I did the black and then reduced uh, the selection and put the white uh, and I moved it over and he's mad about people killing his fish. And uh, yeah, just played with adjusting it a whole lot. And again, I want to stress this is about three minutes, uh, but it was about 45 minutes in real life. <laughs> Uh, and then here's the same thing with them. I brought in Kevin Phillips gave me a stock ellipsed, you know, path that was already built, which is what I'm using here. Uh, and just adjust it real quick. And I, I did, and it, it helps to start with that, but it's still, you know, it takes a while. And then here I'm building, actually the angled um, tail that I'm building here was much easier to work with than the other sort of curved tail. And then you have to combine the tail with the balloon, which is a whole nother thing. Uh, and I ended up giving them a back issue, which is a... Uh, a font Joe Paradise recommended to me uh, for their sort of radio voice, and that's pretty much it. 
So I kind of got that under control, and I got the five pages done with some, you know, sound effects, lettering, it's all legible and okay. Uh, I, I, again, I'm not sure, this is for the preview book and it will go out as is. It's only a five page thing, I'm giving it away for free. Once I get the rest of the book, to my, my goal is to finish through the rest of the book. I, I inked up to page 12. Uh, most of those don't have grays, or have very bare minimum grays. I was working on page 12 today and yesterday, and for whatever reason I started doing full grays as I was doing it. And that wasn't my original plan, but I think I'd been thinking about grays and how to do it and blah blah blah. So going forward, I'm just going to do inks and grays if, my, if it strikes my fancy. When I finish all the pages of this book, 24 pages or whatever, then I'm going to, when I get close to it, I'm going to worry about the lettering. Whether or not I want to go back and do it myself, or hire someone to do it, or get a friend to help me and whether or not I want to change the lettering on those first five pages. I may, I may not, but I'm not going to make that decision now. I got to this point, I'm like, okay, um, what am I going to do for the cover? And I had a, sort of a concept drawing slash digital painting, because it wasn't a lot of line work, it was more shading of the horror I did a while ago. I may have even shown it back during my first hundred days. Uh, I say my first, like this is my second, but you know what I mean, my original series of hundred days. Uh, and I was kind of using that for the mock-up, and I may just use that, because it's nothing I'm using in the actual book, and it's good enough for a mock-up cover, and I don't want to give myself more work to do. Uh, I mean, argue I could, arguably, I could make a print or a pin-up or something to use as the cover, but I, I want to just keep getting pages done, keep getting pages done. Um, and so, it, but it occurred to me that I needed to put a title, a logo, a font, a title treatment, you know, whatever you want to call it, and as weird as it sounds, until like two days ago, it never even occurred to me I'd have to do that. And this gives you an idea of how often I've finished a comic project. I've never really gotten to the point, at least in recent memory, where I've had to design a logo and a front cover. Like, it, maybe back in high school or whatever, but every other project I've done, I've done a few pages or whatever, and it never got published or went anywhere where I needed a front cover. So it, all of a sudden, like, oh, and it's just, you know, when you're working on a book like this, especially when you're doing it all by yourself, it's just like, oh, great, I have to do every single job, and I don't enjoy these jobs, but, you know, so once again, I went to the, the boards, the, the 100 boards and other art groups, and I, I do recommend joining art groups, whatever ones you feel most comfortable with, um, and if you put stuff up and they rip your part and are jerks, quit that group, you know, because all the groups I'm in are pretty supportive, and um, not that they won't critique what you're putting up, but they'll be constructive criticism, and they'll be helpful, and they'll give pointers and say what works and what doesn't, uh, and it's helpful. It's helpful to get an outside point of view, and it's helpful for things that, uh, like with this title treatment, I don't have as much experience. Um, and so I got it to the point where I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, again, it might change later, but at least for the preview book it's fine, um, unless, you know, creativity strikes me and I change it at the last minute. It'll be what it is until I finish the rest of the book, and then I'll revisit the lettering and the title treatment stuff. But actually, I'll go ahead and show you, you know, if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, you've already seen this, but I'll show you what I have now as the preview book, like mock-up cover and title treatment, right here. So I don't do this a lot, um, and these were my first three attempts. The first one was based on a font, the other two were not. Got some feedback. I considered having a square, like a Marvel comic. This was getting closer. I based it on a font, uh, and then kept refining it and refining it. And the font I actually ended up basing it on was the font Will, which I use for these videos. Uh, and the one on the right here, number six, is what I'm probably going with. So the other thing, uh, aside from the lettering and the balloons and the logo, is the grayscale stuff. Now, I'd already set some rules for myself, but it, it was looking a little muddy, and I wasn't sure how I wanted to do it, and I, I found myself, even with the rules, I just kind of like, I haven't looked at a black and white comic in a little while. Like, I've read plenty of them in my life, but I just haven't looked at one recently. So I just went to my shelf of physical comics. Um, mo nowadays, I have a few long boxes, but mostly I try to collect trades, and this proves correct because I could quickly go, oh, okay, and I pulled a stack of all my black and white only books to sort of look through them, see what styles worked, what didn't, uh, what struck my fancy personally, what sh I should go for, and I made a little, like, quick slapdash video of me looking through it that I'll show you right here. This is the Grayscale A Go Go! Okay, so this setup isn't ideal. I grabbed a bunch of black and white slash gray comics off of my shelf. Uh, some are favorites, some are not. They're just the ones I have that are black and white. First being Will Eisner, of course, the legendary uh, storyteller who more or less invented the graphic novel. Now, I have not looked through these beforehand. I'm just flipping through now, and I'm just going for my gut reaction, uh, not a great analytical thing. And as I flip through, he's definitely got a good balance of blacks, whites, and grays. It looks like most of his grays are created by line work, as you can see here. Uh, this is obviously great, but not exactly what I'm going for. So moving on. Another Will Eisner book. I actually got like about six or seven of these at a Comic-Con a couple years ago on the freebie table. I don't know, it was like some warehouse getting rid of them. I don't know why they didn't just sell them for cheap or whatever. Now this is weird. It's actually like a brown ink. But similar thing. All the grays are created through line work, which is not what I'm going for, so I toss it aside. 
Uh, but yeah, I got all those Will Eisner books for free. I just kept going back every couple hours, and by the end of the day, my backpack was bursting with them. It was nuts. Uh, this is Planet Racers. This is Jim Lawson and Peter Laird. This is a book they did years ago after Ninja Turtles. Oh, yeah. Um, again, uh, not any Zipatone or anything like that. Not as much gray work. Mostly a lot of stark black and white. A lot of heavy black. Uh, not really what I'm looking for. Okay. This is Guy Delis, I think is how you pronounce his name. He's a, I think he's a French-Canadian, if I remember right. But anyway, he does a lot of travelogue books. I've got a few of these. And let's see. This is Nice Grays. Not a lot of black, but this is also looks like you shaded it with a pencil or something, so not going to help me. Off to the blocks. There's another one from him. I have a few of his. And I know he changed up his style. Okay, this is kind of a similar style, so I'll chuck that as well. And then here we go. Burma Chronicles. I think this is the one where he changed up his style. And he's sort of doing more digital. And this is probably the closest to what I've been doing so far. With sort of black and white... Not a lot of line shading, and then a lighter gray, and a darker gray. And then here he has even more, so I don't know if he limited his palette very much. But it looks like he's using it not for shading, uh, but for coloring. In other words, the top of the roof house is like, oh, it's a dark red, I'll make it a dark brown, and then whatever. Similarly with the guy's shirts and stuff, and pants, but not really shading as much. A little bit, but not much. But that's closest to what I've been looking for. There's a book from my buddy Mike Dawson. Uh, once again, a lot of line work and a lot of heavy blacks. Nicely done, Mike, but not what I'm looking for. Uh, here's another Mike book. This is his most recent until the, the current one. Uh, once again, a lot of blacks. Basically, looking at all these, it makes me realize I should have more blacks in my books. Uh, here's Robot God Akamatsu, which is a uh, Tranky B. Washington. And this is... He's got a lot of, uh, like, half-tone, I guess, lower the opacity effects in here. A lot of heavy blacks. He's using gr digital grays, similar to what I'll be doing. This book is fun. I always thought it was a little dark, though, and that's kind of what I'm worried about my book happening, too, is being too dark. So this is in the ballpark of what I'm going for, but maybe a little bit lighter. And here we got Flight by Dave Sim. Gerard, who does the backgrounds. So he looks like he's got a Zipatone going over Cerebus. Alright, there's a lot of this kind of stuff. A lot of Zipatone, a lot of cross hatching, a lot of heavy blacks. No shading whatsoever on the white stuff, on the faces uh, of the flesh, you know, the Caucasian looking characters, things like that. That's one thing I'm struggling with. I'm putting shading on my flesh areas. I'm not sure if I should, or at the very least, not do the two tone. Uh, this is a Judge Dredd collection. Got a couple different artists here. Here you can see they're using Zipatone just to do the backgrounds. A lot of heavy blacks and then just Zipatone to pop the back. This is very kind of simple because this is literally cutting out stickers. So there's only so much they could do of it on a deadline and, and it costs money every sticker you buy. Yeah, this is it's interesting, but it's not what I'm going for. I, I really turtles is what comes to my mind, and that's what I've left for last. So I got two turtle oof, two turtle books. This is like the Omnibus Ultimate Collection number one that came out a couple years ago. This is the first few issues printed at a larger size, uh, still in black and white. And as I've talked about before, I think what they did was use Duotone, which is the developer paper that gives you two shades. So good example here, you can see, like right on his face. Let me get up real close. There's two shades of gray. There's the black, and then a dark gray, and then a lighter gray created by different... Uh, textures, but it's brushed on so you get a lot of organic look to it and lines as opposed to just the cutouts. So you can see it here too. Uh, so while I don't have those textures in terms of the, the uh, dots or lines, I am getting those textures as far as brushes because I'm doing it digitally and I don't have to cut it out. And again, heavy blacks. If I go back a bit, well I don't want to go too far back because that's going to be like the super early stuff. I want to be looking at slightly newer stuff. And this is closest to what I'm looking for, but it's kind of muddy here too in places. I guess it's a trick when using grays to try to not get too muddy, but it's almost unavoidable. See, like, a panel like that I think looks gorgeous, but then just, you know, a page before I was looking at a different panel. Well, I already lost it, but so, yeah, a lot of these panels, a lot of these look really nice that have no backgrounds, and they're just using the gray as the background. I guess that's the thing, though, is I'm having trouble making the backgrounds work with cities and stuff. 
And I guess that's the same stuff like here. I think it looks pretty cluttered in theirs as well. But I guess I kind of have a similar style. Maybe that's the kind of stuff that'll work itself out over time. Definitely going to be looking at this book some uh, to see what to do and also what not to do. This is a book I had uh, from a while back. Not when I was a kid, but I, I had got it, you know, maybe I was late teens, early 20s, picked up this collection. Uh, and I really like this book. This was, um, Eastman Lard worked on it, but they also had um, Talbot, Brian Talbot, and a couple other artists. And I kind of like these versions of the Turtles better. This sort of, sort of more modern, kind of look like the cartoon, but then they're also kind of stubby-handed. And as you can see here, uh, less heavy on the blacks. I mean, it still has blacks, but not quite as heavy as some of the others. And then the Duotone again, with two shades. But you can see they're kind of coloring the entire headband with one shade of the duotone and then using different shade for the shading on the, the flesh of the turtle, which is light green. And here you can see it's really dark. And again, this is kind of what I've got going on my book. So my instincts were correct that I should be looking at turtles. So I'm going to look at these two books and, and hopefully that'll help me uh, refine my process. That was Grayscale went went. And yes. Hey, it's Tuesday so towards the end of the day. And I just had a weird moment. Um, like a deja vu flashbacky kind of sense memory trigger type deal. Uh, I have been working on the horror most of the day today. Uh, I haven't put in eight hours, but at least so far it's been about five hours and 15 minutes or so. Mostly doing lettering, which I hate, uh, and working on some gray tones, which is it could be a little tedious, but it, uh, you know, is more enjoyable than lettering at least. Um, but it's starting to get uh, chilly here. I mean, not cold, obviously, because it's California, but where I live, it's not that perennial summer. And so, uh, and this is the time of year, like you see, I'm wearing a hoodie and shorts. That's my favorite outfit of all time, hoodie and shorts. If I go wear that year round, I'm, I'm thrilled. Uh, but anyway, I was coming down the stairs and I felt like the, the chill in the air and it was sort of like the first time I've been outside so I was kind of blinking my eyes and uh, it was, for some reason, the combination of working, and it also hadn't turned on the lights, so it was like very dark in the room where I had been working. And uh, walking outside and feeling that chill just gave me a flashback to when I used to uh, go to Joe Kubert which is a so the Joe Kubert School of Cartoon and Graphic Illustration, I believe is the full title, but it's a comic book school in Dover, New Jersey. It's a three-year program when I went, and I only went for the first year, and then I dropped out. I got some good things out of it, uh, but a lot of the classes were just garbage, uh, teaching you like things that were out of date already, you know, like paste up of mechanicals and things like that, where, you know, we already had computers, <laughs> Microsoft Word and Photoshop, but they're like, oh, first you use a photostat to make it onto plastic paper and cut it out and attach it with, like, wax and, like, crazy stuff like that that was not at all related to, you know, the graphic art field in general, let alone comics. Um, but I do have some good memories, and it just gave me this memory of, like, y you know, oh, there was a time when I was spending most of my day drawing, you know, comics and illustration, uh, just based on what I wanted or class assignments that I was forcing to be what I wanted. Uh, and then, you know, often it would be around dinner time, I'd sort of stumble out of my cave and, you know, when I, when I was living at Joe Kubert, the first half of the year I didn't, when I was living there, it was very much this weather, at least in the beginning, kind of like a, you know, fall or early winter, you know, where it was not too terrible to be outside, it was kind of crisp and nice. And I'd walk like a mile to the diner and meet my friends and, you know, buy french fries with the two dollars I had, or steal french fries off somebody else's table when they didn't eat them, and, uh, I don't know, it was just like a pleasant memory that just kind of really hit me strongly for some reason when I walked out of the house. Um, but I, you know, I mean, not to get uh, philosophical, but I, I feel like that's uh, an indicator that I'm on the right track. If, uh, if what I did today made me have uh, a nostalgic sort of, you know, sense memory, re like recall uh, vividly of a time in my life when I enjoyed <laughs> drawing comics, then, you know, maybe I'm... Maybe I'm heading there. And, and considering I was doing lettering for part of the day, that really means something. Anyway, I'm going to go because I've been walking in circles. Uh, one day I went to uh, the weekend that started this. Today is Friday. The weekend that started this, I did actually go to a flea market to do some toy shopping and stuff. I'm not going to show anything here, but I did a, a quick like few-minute toy shots about it. If you're so interested, I'll put a link below. Um, Gazbot's toy shots. That's right. There's a trail I like the best where it actually feels like you're in the woods a little bit. Another little out-in-the-world update. It is Friday early evening. Uh, I kind of called it quits after about six hours on the horror say. I've had a good week. Uh, was, it's not been quite as good as that power week I had two weeks ago, but it's better than last week. I've mostly been doing uh, work on the horror uh, pretty much full days every day, between six and nine hours depending on the day. Um, but it hasn't all been art. It hasn't all been inking. There's a lot of grayscale, a lot of learning lettering, things like that. Uh, trying to get the preview book 
uh, done for the first five pages and uh, like kind of mock-up covers so that I'll have that for Ape. Uh, I was also working on my Patreon, which I've got like three people following me on Patreon. I don't talk about it very much because I'm not really sure what to do with it other than being the, hey, do you like what I do? Just give me some money. Kind of like tips is sort of how I've been treating it. Um, and I'll sort of continue to treat it that way. I'm not going to make like exclusive content as far as videos or things like that. But what I did do for my Patreon people is I put those five pages up that is finished inks, finished grays, and sort of finished lettering in the sense that it's done. I might go back and tweak it. If I get a letter, I might ask them to revisit it. But it's the five pages of story, one through five, of the Hare 4 that are quote-unquote finished that are going to be in the preview book that I'm going to be uh, giving out only at conventions. Uh, and then never again, because then the book will be out. <laughs> but those five pages, um, which, like I said, are more or less finished, are available to any Patreon that donates a dollar a month or more. So if you thought about maybe doing it, now would be a good time. Uh, but don't do it if you think you're going to get tons of exclusive content, because it, it, mostly it's reposting of things I do on YouTube and stuff like that. And uh, that's why I have it be a monthly uh, fee instead of a per post, because it's mostly stuff I'm giving away for free anyway. So it's more like I see it as tips or encouragement. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, there is an actual perk. That's why I mentioned it. So uh, links below, obviously, or I'll, I'll put a link on the screen here. Uh, and uh, I'm going to get back to my walk. This part's pretty okay, too. Today I was catching up on Ox's videos. I'm behind on a lot of people's videos, uh, but he had mentioned uh, the Jason Brubaker book, um, Unnatural Talent, which I had heard before. Maybe like Emirates mentioned it, but I'd heard it around. And I remember that I had listened to the first one of the chapters uh, and liked it. I don't think it was the first one where he talked about he doesn't believe in talent. It's just like uh, interest and passion and perseverance and skill. And I very much agree with that. So that was like, oh yeah, okay, cool. And uh, he. He talks about how you get it for free or pay what you want, but I guess now that the book is done, it, it's 19 or 20 bucks, which is I paid, and I got it. And it's an audio book, which is great because I can listen to all his work. And I listened to about half of it today. Uh, and it's good stuff. I agree with most of what he's saying. A, a lot of it's like, oh, I wish I listened to this before I did the 100 days, right? The beginning of my 100 days. Because a lot of it's like stuff that would have helped me push through things that I've already pushed through or approaches that I could take back when I was starting. I mean, it's definitely worth getting, listening to, reading, whatever, for anybody that's, you know, trying to do their first comic or trying to make time to do a comic, or, or even, like I said, like, I agreed with most of what he said. A lot of it is, like, sort of things I've already done or already should have done, um, but then there's also always things you can learn about advertising and things on the internet, and, like, so there, I'm getting stuff out of it, even though a lot of it I'm not at that phase right now, but I was also happy that a lot of things he recommend I, I'm doing. Like, he's like, do a character sheet, do turnarounds. I'm like, I did that. He's like, you know, write your whole script. I did that. You know, things to kind of prepare yourself for success. A lot of the pre-production. Now, he does warn against getting so ready for the trip, as it were, that you're never going on the trip. Now I'm on the trip, but I'm glad I did that pre-production. I did just enough that I didn't hold myself back forever. And I think a lot of it was done during the 100 Days of Making Comics that I did, so I knew that I couldn't kind of keep it up forever. And in the back of my head, I'm like, well, how many episodes can I do where I'm talking about getting ready? But everything I did ahead of time did help and it continues to help. And uh, But I, I recommend checking out his book. One thing I will say, and not to be negative, because I've seen his art and it's great and he has a lot of good points, but I don't... his his The audio book... I like it that it's audio because I listen to him working, but it's a little jarring and it's a little bit, he does like impressions and he does goofy voices from time to time. When he's just speaking, he's got a fine speaking voice. And I'm one to talk, I know, because I'm a big, you know, goofball animated kind of character. But I don't know, and I even said to Q, I was like, I feel like if it was a video, it wouldn't bother me as much. But I'll be like looking down, drawing, and he'll be like, yeah. And so the things you have to remember, you know, you're not going to get rich and famous overnight. I mean, hey, you know, and I'm like, what the, oh, you jerk, you know, like, I don't know, it just bothered me. It's a dumb nitpick, and, and if by some crazy chance Jason Brubaker watched this, I, I hope you don't take offense. Uh, I think everything you had to say was good. I think you're a great artist. It's just the, the audio when I was kind of focusing in on my art, and then every now and then you bust out with these, like, improv -y style, you know, Saturday Night Live voices really threw me. Uh, but I digress. And I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> uh, I definitely feel like uh, I'm getting in the mindset of looking around at things to, to draw, um, both things that I'm going to need to draw and just things I might need to draw. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm getting... I When I go on my walks, I started noticing the sidewalk um, because I've had to draw sidewalks both in Kid Switch and in the Horror 4. I know how to draw a sidewalk. I know what a sidewalk is, you know, but there's little details that I'm noticing more not that it has to be super detailed, but knowing these details and I could choose whether to include them or not is a good thing. Like, for example, I used to draw a sidewalk where it'd be like, you know, two lines, and then I'd put a parallel line every now and then. 
And at some point I realized, oh, there's also another line here. Like there's the sidewalk and then there's a little, you know, half foot curvy kind of line. So I started adding that. And I also used to draw my sidewalks as though they were like two inches tall. And I'm like, well, they're actually, you know, more like eight inches, 12 inches, depending, you know, it's like, you know, that tall, not that tall. Uh, and then again, I'm, I was looking at it and I was like, oh, the, those horizontal lines, if this is the sidewalk coming towards you, those horizontal lines, they always go like this. And then there's that curb. And it seems, at least on the ones by my house, only every other square does it go around the curb. And then you know, just like little details like that, which again, depending on how realistic or detailed you are, you don't have to put that all in, but it's good to know it. And it's good to decide if you want to have it and you can hint at it. And, and I don't know, it just makes me feel more confident to have that information. And especially even if I'm hinting at it or being loose or not super tight or detailed, I, it's almost like because I know what it's supposed to look like, it's easier to simplify it, distill it down, you know? Um, and so there's that side of it where I've been noticing, and I've been noticing trees and things like that, you know, just more than I normally do in, in terms of how would I draw it? Let me try to remember that, you know, maybe take a picture of it. Um, and actually I did say, take some pictures of the sidewalk, which I was going to throw up, but there's no point. Uh, but I will show you these pictures I took after I went to that flea market. Uh, I had to wait. We were going to eat and my friend was in the bathroom and I was just killing time out front. And first there was a glass door and it was like a rest, not a restaurant, but you know, like a fast food restaurant. And I, I don't know what, why, but there was some kind of glass door and inside was all these weird um, like meters like power meters and stuff but like a whole thing of them and I'm like that would look cool I could see putting that somewhere in the horror like you know in some factory or in some military installation just as like cool machinery so I took a bunch of pictures I may or may not use them but again I was in that mindset here's those so you can see it's really nothing that crazy but it, the fact that it was there seemed fortuitous and I tried to get a couple close-ups and side angles and then I made a point of trying to get the bottom and the top because I've taken reference before and then didn't have certain parts of it and had to make it up which is fine but it's just nice to know what it, it is. That's pretty much all it is. That was those. Um, you know, so there's that. I think uh, I'm going to wrap it up. There's a lot of junk in the middle here. Hopefully it won't be as long as the last one. And uh, I'm gonna be putting this up in like two different toy shots. And I have a backlog of videos I still have to do. So good, <laughs> hey, I did work on a new print last weekend too, but I didn't finish it. Um, it's, I'd say it's like a third of the way done. I'm not gonna mention what it is in case it doesn't finish. But my plan is to work on it again this weekend. So hopefully the next time you see me, I can tell you about my second new print that I'll have for a show. Maybe not. Anyway, this has been Gazbot for toy sh Wait, no, this isn't Gazbot toy shots. I just did two of those. <laughs> when Jason Brubaker would just get loud and crazy. Nah. <laughs> but I wanted a snack, so what shall I have? Oh, I found other food I got a long time ago. This is pickled beets that I got when I w drove down south to some, I don't know. It's pickled beets. Let's see, they've been in there for months. Good luck me. Pickled beets, can't get it open. Um, er, 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 can't do that. So, what I'm gonna try to do, I don't, want to, I don't have one of those rubber grip things, but I have an oven mitt. It's got rubber inside. Wow. Even when I'm inside, I have lighting problems with those crazy lights. Whenever I set up a real setup, I just look crazy. Haha. <laughs> but anyway, oven mitt solution. Gazbot style. Pickled beets. Here we go. Here we <laughs> Bring it in close to my... Oh my god. Now, I'm not the strongest guy in the world, but I'm not super weak either. This, do pickled beets, like, expand glass over time? Pickled beets! I'm going to try uh. to tap it with a knife, because I think my aunt may have said that helps. I don't remember. Oh. <laughs> pickled beets, pickled beets, come to me. Pickled beets, open up, share your treats. Come to me, pickled beets. Now. Now, forgot my special glove. Mm -hmm. Pickle feet. Pickle comes. Oh my god. This isn't acting. Oh, I think I hurt. <laughs> oh, that was weird. I I was straining here, but when I stopped, like, somewhere, like, in what should be my deltoid and tricep, although is really just a mushy mess, uh, <laughs> like, twinged and hurt. I, I hurt my non-muscle, everybody. This is the best video ever. Okay, I have one more idea. Hot water. I'm gonna run it under hot water. 
because hot condenses the molecules. Run it under hot water. Uh, and I, I don't know if it's supposed to be like the opposite of expansion when things get cold, or maybe the idea is it gets under the rim where maybe like salt is congealed or something. Oh, my arm actually really hurts. Okay, uh, trying to use mostly my right arm with my mitt. Here we go. My hand just cracked in a weird way. Oh, ha, ha! Hear that pop? Wow, that's strong. Um, so I think hot water is what did it. There's your tip from Gazbot. Pickled beets, hot water goes. All right, I took a few out. Now, I've never really just had these like this. My family used to make them with like onions and eggs, and mainly you'd eat the pickled eggs. So this is kind of a weird thing. I'm going to cut. It's a little thicker. And like chewier than I remember, but the flavor's not bad. Let's try again. I can't get it on my fork. No, yeah, not bad. Need salt, but otherwise, a win. Pickled beets, pickled beets, shared their treats in my mouth. Oh, my tongue's all red. I bet y'all have red poop. So I ate two beets, and they were decent, and I uh, made a plate of them, brought them over to the TV, ate a third, just kind of, meh. Put some salt on them. No, apparently two beets is my limit. So, goodbye to beets of the pickled variety. All of you! I'll catch you later.